Okay, well, because it's a topical that, you know, we're not dealing with any one particular verse, so let me give you another one of the verses that uh, we'll make reference to in, in the sermon. That's Matthew chapter 8, verses 11 and 12, and I think you'll, you'll see its relevance uh, if you just think through what's going on here and what the context is and uh, what's going to happen to the wicked, okay? So Jesus says this, uh, and by the way, he said this in, in response to the centurion uh, who had the great faith. Jesus only had to speak the word, and he knew that his servant would be healed. And when he saw that, he, he saw his father's promise to him being fulfilled that he was going to bring the Gentiles in as well. And that makes sense of what he says. So beginning in verse 11, I say to you, that many will come from east and west, talking about the Gentiles, and will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, what do you think Jesus is talking about there? And he's talking about the destruction of the wicked but notice if they're destroyed ultimately or, or completely, how can they be weeping? How can they be um, you know, in, in grieving over their situation? How can they be angry and be gnashing their teeth if they don't exist? Okay, so we're going to look at that in other passages. All right, so last week, remember, we asked the question, <clears throat> is my neighbor really all that bad, as bad as the Bible makes him out to be? And we saw the answer is that, you know, it must be yes, you know, because that's what the Bible tells us, as Paul says to the Romans. Uh, in Romans 3, verse 4, let God be found true, though every man be found a liar. And this just simply reminds us that people have opinions, right? But the way we determine truth is not, not through opinions, and we don't even determine it through history, you know, what actually took place in, in the history of the world or the church. But we determine truth by what God says in His Word. And He, he speaks very clearly on this. He tells us through the Apostle Paul uh, in Romans 3, verse 10, there is none righteous. You know, there is no one who does what is right. No one. He says, not even one. There are no exceptions. And again, we noted that Adam's sin plunged the whole human race into ruin because of his guilt imputed to us, we were born without the Spirit, and without the Spirit, we were completely dead to God. Our hearts were evil. Where there is no Spirit, there is no goodness, there is no love. So what the Lord said about those living in Noah's day, you know, which we think they're sort of uniquely evil, that wasn't the case, but it, it's equally true of everyone who has been born into this world accepting Jesus Christ only. But he says this in Genesis 6, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know, that is the situation with everyone who doesn't have the Spirit. And the only, only those who have the Spirit are those who are born again uh, by God's grace. Now, we also saw that it's because God restrains their sin through the Spirit, not in a saving way, but in His common grace way, with that, you know, by basically working in a variety of ways through their conscience, by making them feel guilty, making them feel bad when they do things that are wrong, uh, through societal restraints of law and, and the penalties for breaking those laws because of what other people might think of them. You know, vanity is a, is a very powerful way of restraining uh, sin. And through the common goodness that God shows to all mankind. You know, remember that uh, we saw that if God were to take away all his restraints, what we call common grace, okay? If he were to take away all his restraints and all of his kindnesses to the wicked, the world would rise up and destroy the church, okay? So God gives this common grace, which men don't deserve. They, they, they deserve exactly the opposite, but he gives it so that he might preserve the world so that he can continue through his church to call out his elect through the Great Commission. So the point is, we don't want to be deceived into thinking that our neighbor really isn't in any danger. Okay, we can't, we can't look at their behavior and say, well, you know, it's kind of like the, 
the, the Boy Scout, the unconverted Boy Scout who helps the little old lady across the street, right? You know, the typical uh, sort of you know, view of or idea of what a good work is. What that Boy Scout is doing is actually sin in the eyes of God because he's unconverted and he doesn't love God and he's not doing it for his glory and his honor. Instead, he's doing it for a merit badge or for some other reason, okay? And I know that may sound, you know, trivial, but it really isn't, okay? Everything we do, even if we do the right thing, if it's not done for the glory of God, it does not please God. Un the unconverted cannot please God because his heart is only evil continually. Okay, but as I said, there's another belief that has even intruded into the church that can also undermine evangelism, okay? And that is that there is no hell that is threatening the unbeliever, okay? Uh, I think many churches have discovered that there are certain teachings that aren't very popular and tend not to build large churches. You know, one of those teachings is Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross. You don't like to talk about the blood atonement of Christ, but another one is hell. You know, people don't like to hear about hell. It, it, you know, they don't, if you're preaching hell, people won't tend, to, you know, will tend not to want to come back. So there's, there's uh, because of that, it's, for the most part, I think the doctrine is largely ignored. And even attempts have been made to put out its fire. You know, we're going to see that even the cults try to use the doctrine of hell against true Christianity to try to talk people out of it because they're making God out, and at least we're making God out, to be some kind of horrible monster or fiend who would send people there when really he's a God of love. All right, so it's either ignored or um, there are attempts that are made to put out its fire. And the main attempts amount, I think, to two. And I've already mentioned them to you, universalism and annihilationism. Now, there's two kinds of universalism. By the way, this is pretty broad. We're not going to get into all the nitty-gritty of what all these different groups might necessarily believe because there's always differences within parties. But universalists, some universalists simply deny that hell exists. Okay, nobody's going there because it doesn't exist. Everyone's going to be saved. While others affirm that it exists, but they see it as corrective, okay? And their thinking is basically this, that the sins that we commit against other people, even if we should murder somebody, those are only finite sins because we commit them against creatures, and they don't, they don't deserve eternal punishment. So God may send them to hell for a time to correct them, you know, to punish them for those crimes they committed. But he will eventually release all of them and bring them to heaven. Some believe even the fallen angels, even Satan and his demons, will eventually be redeemed and come into the new heavens and the new earth because God is just too good, he's just too loving to leave anyone to suffer forever in hell. And annihilationism, okay, is the belief that those who, who, those who don't receive Christ will not suffer in hell forever, but will be completely destroyed. And perhaps also because God is a God of love and he cannot bear to see them suffering forever. Now, we know that um, any attempt to ignore or simply to deny that hell exists isn't going to fly because the Bible plainly teaches that there is a hell. But the question that we have in front of us this evening is, are, are really three, okay? Will those who were sent there suffer forever, okay, eternal torment? Will they suffer for a time and then be released, okay, universalism? Or will they be destroyed, annihilationism? Well, what I want us to do is focus on that last question, will they be destroyed? Because I think it really answers all of the questions, okay? So we're going to look at annihilationism. And as we disprove annihilationism, we'll see that, you know, the, the, it also disproves universalism and tells us or shows us that eternal torment is actually what the Bible teaches, okay? So first of all, let me, let's again define annihilationism, and let me give you a, a definition that R.C. Sproul gave in his sermon entitled, Where the Worm Does Not Die. 
he writes this, okay, universal, excuse me, annihilationism is the idea. The idea is that when the impenitent sinner who is not redeemed draws his last breath at the end of his life, that's what it is, his last breath. He has nothing to fear after death except eternal unconsciousness because he will be blotted out of existence and the eternality of his punishment will be simply that on which he misses out. He will miss the great joy which the believer has looked forward to, everlasting life in the presence of God and with Christ. According to annihilationism, a person's hell is that he misses out on everlasting life and he misses it forever. But there's no ongoing punishment after death. As soon as the person dies, he goes into oblivion. Now the question is, who believes that, okay? Who believes that? Well, John Gerstner in his, his series, his, his course essentially, his course lectures on the theology of Jonathan Edwards tells us that this is the belief of just about every cult, every Christian cult. Now there are some exceptions, but he would say in, the, in its generality. And let me just give you one example from one of the cults that actually does believe in that. And that would be the Watchtower Society. I think you recognize that as the Jehovah's Witnesses. So on their website, they ask this question, is hell a place of eternal suffering? And their answer is this, no. The original words translated as hell in some older Bible translations, Hebrew, Sheol, Greek, Hades, basically refer to the grave, that is the common grave of mankind. The Bible shows that people in the grave are in a state of non-existence. The dead are unconscious and so cannot feel pain. God has set death, not torment, in a fiery hell as the penalty for sin. God told the first man, Adam, that the penalty for breaking God's law would be death. He said nothing about eternal torment in hell. The idea of eternal torment is repugnant to God. Such an idea is contrary to the Bible's teaching that God is love. He wants us to worship Him out of love, not fear of eternal torment. Okay. Now we're going to come back and we're going to answer these objections that, that uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses have raised, but I want you to notice that they're using our belief in eternal torment to speak against the Christian faith. Okay, to speak against our beliefs and to say, there's a better, because we believe in a God who doesn't you know, make people suffer forever in hell. But I also want you to notice, too, that there's another view here. They don't believe that there's a hell that God casts people into and they are annihilated, although what their, their view essentially you know, amounts to the same thing. Okay, when a person dies, that's it. Okay. Now, there are other cults that hold to annihilationism, Christadelphians. Uh, their, their views are rather obscure. Um, but one of their main views is Jesus is not God, and that excludes them right away. The Worldwide Church of God, Arm, Armstrongism. By the way, the Worldwide Church of God has split into at least two segments, and those that continue, uh, the continuing Church of Armstrongism, they believe in annihilationism. I'm not sure what the others uh, believe. Some have actually turned more towards Orthodox Christianity. Uh, Seventh-day Adventists hold this position, but I'm not saying necessarily they're a cult, but they, their beginnings were cultic, and um, they still hold to Ellen G. White as being a prophetess. She's been proven to be a plagiarizer of many people's works, wrong in many different ways, uh, proven to be, like I said, a false prophetess. So, I, you know, I'd say let's kind of stay away from that, but they believe in annihilationism. Uh, what's more concerning to us, though, is that there are evangelicals who have adopted this position. Now, one of them, Clark Pinnock, we might question <laughs> whether he was an evangelical. I think uh, toward the end of his life, he adopted a view called open theism, that God doesn't know the future, anything can happen. You know, he was originally a Calvinistic, and then he adopted Arminianism, but then he realized that the criticism of the Calvinist against the Arminian, that the fact that God knows the future means that God must approve of what he sees, otherwise he wouldn't see those things happening, which means he's in control. Clark Pinnock saw the, the reasonableness of that argument and said, well, therefore, God must not see the future. Well, if you have a God who can't tell what's going to happen in the future, you don't have an infinite God. 
So it's essentially a denial of God. But anyway, he also adopted annihilationism. John Wynnum, and actually these next, um, next th well, three of these are actually Anglicans. He was an Anglican biblical scholar. Philip Edgecombe Hughes, also Anglican. Stephen Travis, New Testament scholar. John Stott, okay, Anglican priest and theologian who was very influential during his life in the British and American churches is perhaps the best known among those and representative of this position. So let me give to you uh, John Stott's four arguments for annihilationism. Why, why do people believe that? Okay. Well, first he says, the biblical language of the judgment of hell points to destruction. Okay, Not eternal suffering, but destruction. And he writes this, it would seem strange if people who are said to suffer destruction are in fact not destroyed, and it is difficult to imagine a perpetually inconclusive process of perishing. In other words, they're being destroyed, but they're never destroyed. Okay, so he's saying the word destruction means that they must be destroyed. Secondly, the biblical imagery of fire. He says fire's main purpose is not to inflict pain, but to destroy or to annihilate. So that's what he believes that the fires of hell represent, is annihilation. Thirdly, the false, false belief, now notice, the false belief that God will give to the souls of the wicked immortality. See, he, he thinks that's some kind of platonic idea, that, uh, that the soul being intrinsically immortal, and he doesn't believe that anywhere in the Bible is to say that God actually gives immortality to the souls of all men. Okay, so we're going to have to come back and answer those. And then finally, here it is again, the love of God. He writes, the vindictiveness, that is eternal suffering, is incompatible with the love of God in Christ. And he further writes, whatever anyone says, unending torment speaks to me of sadism, not justice. So he's pretty harshly criticizing God if he's going to punish somebody forever. Now again, that last reason appears to be the main reason most who reject hell do so. They just don't, they see it incompatible with the love of God. You know, I'm going to argue at the end that, that the love of God is what actually requires it. But let me just give you an illustration. I've been giving you some personal illustrations lately. But years ago when I was doing a delivery route, I'd, I'd run into a number of people and sometimes was able to talk to them about Christ. And I ran into a woman who said she believed in heaven and believed she was going there, of course, but rejected hell. And so I asked the question why she believed in heaven. You, know, you could see where I was going with this. Why do you believe heaven exists? Well, she says, well, because the Bible teaches it. Well, then I asked, why don't you believe in hell? Uh, you know, she said, because I can't imagine a loving God sending anyone to hell. But then I reminded her that the Bible teaches that hell exists. And she says, oh, but I don't believe that. Okay, you see the inconsistency. I'm just going to believe what I choose to believe. The Bible says heaven exists. I believe that. I, it says hell exists. Well, I don't believe that. But the overriding reason was because she thought that was incompatible with the love of God. Okay, now why is it important that we believe hell to be a place of conscious and eternal torment of the wicked? Well, okay, so why, why is it important that we argue this point? Why can't we just say, okay, it's okay for you to be annihilationist, uh, you for be a universalist, and, and I'll be an eternal tormentist? Um, why, why is that, you know, why, what's wrong with that? Well, first of all, the Bible only teaches one position. We have to believe what the Bible teaches. Secondly, because the Bible does teach it, God warns, okay, God warns in the Bible that many are going there unless they repent and turn to Christ, okay? That's the danger that we need to warn them of. And thirdly, because this is one of the greatest motivators that God has ever given to get people to begin to seek after his mercy because they're concerned about that. Now, Jonathan Edwards said that people, and I want to just remind us here that, that people never change, okay? Human nature never changes. Uh, so what he said in his day, what he believed in his day is equally true today. But people are far more concerned to avoid pain than they are on missing out on pleasure. And when you consider, 
you know, think about evangelizing. You're evangelizing people who don't know Christ, who are unconverted, who the thoughts of their hearts are only evil continuously, and you present heaven to them. Now, a lot of people have a misunderstanding of heaven. They think they want to go to heaven because they think the fishing's better up there, or when they gamble, they're going to win every time, or they can do whatever they want to. They, they want to go there, you see, because that's what they think heaven is. But when you describe to them what heaven really is, you know, the presence of the holy God, the absence of sin, the worship of God, the, the permeation of the Holy Spirit in this world of love and among the saints, and, you know, that is not going to be attractive to them at all. So that's not going to be a motive that you can use if they really understand it. But you can use the motive of eternal torment in hell because pain is something they do understand. So that is a motive that we can offer. And let me just remind you that that is exactly the motive that John the Baptist offered the people of God to get them ready for the coming of the Messiah. Flee from the wrath that is coming. Well, how can we flee? Well, this is what you need to do. Repent, okay? So that is something they do understand. Well, annihilationism removes that motivation. You really have nothing left. In a very real sense, it eliminates the punishment. Not that people would necessarily, um, you know, relish the idea of non-existence, but still, non-existence compared to eternal torment, you would choose non-existence. All right. So secondly, we need to consider why annihilationism cannot be correct. So here where I want to answer some of the objections that have been raised by the Watchtower Society, by John Stott, and then I want to give a series of arguments that Jonathan Edwards gave against annihilationism. So first of all, with regard to the Watchtower argument regarding the meaning of Sheol and Hades, and by the way, they are correct when they say that these words refer to the grave. And if you look in the King James Version of the Bible, you'll find that Hades is sometimes mistranslated hell, okay? We need to understand there's a distinction between Hades and hell. Hades is the abode of the dead. Sheol is the abode of the dead. Everyone dies and goes into Sheol, okay? When it said that Christ descended into the earth or that he went into Sheol or that you will not allow my soul to remain in Sheol. It was not talking about hell. It was talking about the grave, okay? That was his body in the grave. That is true, okay? They're correct there. But, okay, uh, we should mention, and I should mention this as well, in Sheol, you know, as we see the descriptions of it, there's no activity. You know, the rich and the poor, the mighty and the weak, they're all equalized. There's no activity. There's no worship. There's nothing going on in Sheol. And that's the reason why some people believe in soul sleep, okay, is because they think Sheol is the afterlife, and that's all that's happening, okay? That, that isn't all that's happening. That's referring to the grave. And if you go out to a cemetery, you'll see that that is true. There's not a lot of activity going on, you know, in the cemetery, except, of course, bodies decomposing. But the word used for the fiery hell is another word altogether. It's Gehenna. You know, it's this that Jesus warns about. For instance, in Matthew 9, verses 47 through 49, if your eye causes you to stumble, throw it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell, into Gehenna, okay, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Now, remember that Gehenna was, you know, the, the valley of, of Hinnom. That's where the, fire, the fires were burning, where the Jews would bring their trash out and throw it into the fire. It was constantly burning. And Jesus used that as a picture of the eternal fire, which is continually burning, okay? Um, it's, it's a different concept, a different idea altogether. If you confuse those two, you can fall into the trap. So the grave is where the body goes, Sheol, Hades, hell is where the soul goes, or heaven, depending upon, of course, which, you know, whether you're trusting in Christ or not. Now, with regard to Stott's four arguments, first, that hell is called eternal destruction. It is. It is called destruction. But the word for destruction in the Bible can also be translated ruin, or utter ruin, or perdition. It doesn't require that the individual be literally destroyed. So first of all, that's a false argument. The word does not mean 
that it's obliterated. It just means it's ruined, destroyed in a certain sense, okay? With regard to his argument about fire, well, yeah, fire does burn things up. It does destroy things, but fire also does inflict pain. And it doesn't really matter that fire can do both. The question is, how is the Lord using it, okay? It's reference, you know, that is its meaning in reference to hell. That's the reason why Jesus uses the word fire, because he wants to evoke the idea of pain. It's tormenting. It may not be a literal fire in the beginning, you know, during the, the present time, because it's, it's a soul that's suffering in those flames. Are those literal flames? Can they actually touch a soul? Or is it simply symbolic of the torment the soul is undergoing? It feels like fire. Fire is not a pleasant thing to experience. Okay, it's forever burning, but never burns up. Okay, that's, again, the idea of fiery hell. With regard to eternal life, now it is true that God does not give the wicked eternal life, but eternal life and immortality are two different things, aren't they? He says that he gives to the wicked. He meets out, 2 Thessalonians 1.9, eternal destruction eternal ruin, and the word eternal indicates that the wicked must continue to exist in order to experience the eternal ruin, the eternal destruction, the eternal fire. And then finally, with regard to God's love being inconsistent with hell, I'm going to have to put that on pause for just a moment. The Watchtower also believes that, but I wanted to come back to that at the conclusion. But let me now give you a list of arguments that Jonathan Edwards used to refute annihilationism in his own day, as they're explained by John Gerstner in his book, The Rational Biblical Theology of Jonathan Edwards. And I did skip a couple of them because there were, the distinctions between them are so subtle. I didn't, I didn't get them. I wasn't sure that I could explain it to you, but there are some pretty powerful ones here. So quoting Gerstner, he says, first, the Bible teaches eternal punishment. It is eternal. For the very word used for eternal life is used for eternal death. And this punishment implies pain, which annihilationism, or excuse me, annihilation is not. Annihilation is the relief which the wicked begging for will never receive. Let me just mention as I read these, John Gerser doesn't pull any punches here. But eternal punishment, punishment implies pain. It's the same word used for eternal life. It's eternal punishment, pain that is inflicted forever, okay? Annihilationism would be a welcome alternative to the pain. Secondly, it is also clear that the wicked shall be sensible of the punishment they are under. Now, he doesn't explain that, but let me just, let me just give you, again, the, the passage we read for our text for this evening. What Jesus said to the Jews in Matthew 8 after he saw the faith of the centurion, beginning in verse 11, many will come from east and west and will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now remember what uh, R.C. Sproul said about that, that I used to understand that as uh, the pain would be so intense that it would make people weep. I mean, when you hurt, you cry, right? And they'd be gnashing their teeth because of the pain. But he was saying the weeping is because of, of the sorrow or the grief that they wake up and find themselves in hell. And the gnashing of teeth is the anger that they're expressing towards the Lord for his, uh, for his putting them in this place. But notice, the wicked shall be sensible of the punishment they are under. Some will be weeping and some will be gnashing their teeth. And however you understand that, it shows that they are aware of their punishment. Thirdly, he says, degrees of punishment preclude annihilation. If the Bible teaches degrees of punishment in hell, then there has to be a hell for people to experience those degrees, okay? And Jesus clearly speaks of differing levels of punishment based on differing levels of sin. Let me give you an example. Speaking of his second coming uh, and his judgment in Luke 12, verses 47 and 48, he says this, And that slave who knew his master's will and did not get ready or act in accord with his will 
will receive many lashes, but the one who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. Now, what's Jesus talking about? He's talking about the master who leaves, leaves his servants in charge of his household. After his journey, he comes back. He finds some are being faithful and some aren't, and he either rewards or punishes them. He's talking about his, his leaving after his work of redemption is completed and then his return, you know, having committed uh, the work of his house to his servants and their reward. But notice those who knew his will and did not do it, didn't act in accord with his will, will receive many lashes. But those who did not know it and committed deeds worthy of a flogging will receive but few. There are degrees of punishment in hell when the Lord returns. Remember how he talked about those cities where he preached the gospel and they rejected it? He says in Matthew 10, 15, Truly I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. That means that the punishment for Capernaum, for instance, was going to be worse. You know, Capernaum where Jesus preached and taught and, and did his miracles and they rejected him versus Sodom and Gomorrah, that evil city that was full of homosexuality and, and uh, remember what they did to, to uh, you know, Lot and what they wanted to do to the daughters and what they did to the Lord and the angels or the angels who came into the, into the town. He destroyed them. He says, it's going to be worse for Capernaum than for Sodom and Gomorrah. There are degrees of punishment. Paul says in Romans chapter 2, in verses 5 and 6, but because of your stubbornness, speaking to the Jews, because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. See, there can't be degrees of punishment if there's no punishment. Jesus is talking about degrees of punishment. So there must be a punishment that one would endure. If there's annihilationism, everybody gets the same punishment. There are no degrees and there's no punishment because they're gone, okay? I hope you understand the point there. Fourthly, he says, annihilation is no state at all and is therefore inconsistent with a man's soul which is never destroyed. Now here he's, he's simply saying what, what, what um, Jonathan Edwards said in a particular sermon on this subject. He doesn't attempt to prove that the soul is immortal. He just simply assumes it. But again, remember, Stott believed it's wrong to think that God gives immortality to the soul of the wicked. But eternal punishment in varying degrees requires that they exist eternally to experience that punishment. You may not say necessarily that God makes the soul immortal, but we see from the fact that some of these are going to be experiencing punishment forever, that they must be eternal. They have to be there to experience the punishment. Fifthly, he says this, men would never know their judgment if annihilation were their punishment. Instead of God repaying them face to face, they would never have to face God at all. That's what Jehovah's Witnesses believe. You die and that's it. No punishment. No judgment, no day of judgment, just death. Sixth, it could not be said, and, and um, here's, here's where we bring that meditation in, which I said that verse by itself proves that there must be eternal punishment. It could not be said that it was better for the wicked not to have been born if they have no judgment awaiting them. Now, remember, that's our meditation. Let me read it again. The Son of Man is to go, just as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been good for that man if he had not been born. Now, the point is, if you're, not, if you're never born, you don't exist. If you're annihilated, you don't exist. There's no difference between never being born and being annihilated. In both the instances, you don't exist. But Jesus said it would have been good for him if he had never been born, which means, well, he's really talking about the judgment that he's going to have to endure. And by the way, notice that Gerstner said, he applied this more broadly. We sometimes think that this refers only to Judas when Jesus said that. It is true of everyone who doesn't trust in Jesus that it would have been better for them if they had never been born 
rather than to have been born to live and die unrepentant without trusting Christ and have to face an eternity of suffering. I, I hope you see the, the, the point there. Say, so Jesus tells us annihilationism cannot be true. Now, finally, I want to return to Stott's last argument, as well as that of this, the Watchtower Society, that eternal punishment is inconsistent with God's love. Now, I think instead of arguing against hell, it actually strengthens the case for hell when we understand God's love, okay? Remember, God's love is a, is a holy love. God is love. And it's his love, his love for what is right, his love for what is good, his love for what is pure and holy that makes him hate evil and requires him to punish evil. In other words, his love for holiness, his love for what is good is what makes hell necessary. God cannot have sin in his presence. He must punish the wicked because of his love for what is good and what is right. And that is the love of God. And because the wicked have committed sins against his infinite worthiness, that punishment has to be infinite. Remember the idea that I mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, there are those among the universalists who believe that the sins we commit are really finite sins. Uh, surely you wouldn't have to be in, in hell for very long to pay for those. So we go to hell, we suffer, and then we're released because we've satisfied justice. Well, no, we haven't because the sins we commit against God we know are infinite sins because we are, they're committed against an infinitely worthy being. But since no finite creature, which is what we are, can endure an infinite punishment, that punishment must go on eternally. That's the reason why torment is eternal. The wicked must suffer forever because their suffering will never pay their debt to God's justice. Okay, so his love is not inconsistent with eternal punishment. Now, I know what they mean by that. God can't bear to see, you know, the unbeliever suffering. That's something else we need to look at. But, um, and we will do that just in a moment. But I want us to see this other point. It's God's love, his holy love, that makes hell necessary. But with regard to the fact, can God bear to see the, the wicked suffering in hell? You know, one thing Jonathan Edwards points out that's clear in the Bible, though some of us have a hard time reconciling this with, with the idea of how God views the reprobate, is the passage that says God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked would turn from his sin and that God would forgive him. That, that is true. Edwards believes that when God looks at the wicked in hell and sees them suffering, that he takes no pleasure in their suffering if that suffering is just simply considered by itself, if that's all he's looking at. But we need to remember that's not all he's looking at, okay? Let me just mention here, in this sense, that would agree with Stott. You know, God doesn't enjoy seeing people suffering. You know, just, just the suffering in and of itself without anything else in view. He doesn't take any pleasure in that, but Edwards would continue. He does take pleasure in that suffering in light of the debt that they owe to his divine justice, that his justice is being meted out. They are getting what they deserve. And we can, we can put it in terms maybe we can understand. Would, would we enjoy watching an innocent person being killed, being executed? No, that would, that would be horrific. We wouldn't enjoy that. We wouldn't, you know, take any pleasure in that. But we might if the person who was being executed was a murderer, then we, we would sense the fact that he's getting justice and that's what he deserves. That is what God looks at. He looks at the justice of it when he looks at the suffering, not just at the suffering in and of itself. Perhaps if Stott had, had understood that, he might not have taken uh, that position. Okay, so the point is this. God is not going to annihilate the wicked but he's going to continue to uphold them in being as he forever pours out his wrath on them for their sins, for their violation of his love, of his justice, of his love for what is good 
and what is right. And I want you to note, too, that every point that we just brought up also refutes universalism. The idea that men are going to eventually come out of hell or that the, you know, the, the devil and his angels are going to be released from hell because they will have satisfied God's justice. They're not coming out because they will never satisfy it. And the bottom line of all of this is simply this, that this is why we need to reach out to people with the gospel, because this is what they will have to endure forever unless they turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, how will they call upon him in whom they have not heard? Okay, we need to let them know about Christ. Well, with that in mind, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to uh, remember some of these things and be able to use them, uh, not only to convince ourselves, you know, but also other people that hell is a reality that, um, you know, many are going to have to endure. Well, let's pray.